book of Romans chapter 1 this morning, diving right in, church. You know the drill. You know the section that we're looking at. By the way, we're looking at a message titled, Called to be Encouraged, and we're going to be looking at that, and we need that. We saw it last week. We see it this week, and by God's grace, we'll finish off down to verse 17 today, and uh, we need to get ready for that because um, what's coming is going to need our encouragement to stand strong in a day of darkness. So Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 7, I'll read the odd-numbered verses. If you'll join in the New King James Version Bible, please, on the screen. If you don't have that, in the even numbers. So here we go. Paul, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. Now, I do not want you to be unaware or uninformed, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you, who are in Rome also. And I'll end here in verse 17. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Father, Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen, Amen. church, you can be seated. And I don't know about you, it just dawned on me, as you were reading verse 16, does it automatically put a smile in your heart? Verse 16, I mean, that is a powerhouse declaration, And, and again, by God's grace, we'll get to that verse today. We need to get to it today. But we're talking about being encouraged, and last time we saw this, that you and I are called, we learned... Saints, we are called righteous by God, we are called forgiven, we are called his children. The Bible here tells us that we are also called to be encouraged, and we need that very, very much. And we saw in, in starting in verse 7 last time that uh, this is true because of where we are, where you are, that we are the church of the living God. The Bible tells us that as believers, the church, remember it's not the building, it's not the building, it's where you are. Wherever you and I gather is the church. And I love that. By the way, that's one of the arguments for the church. Listen, in this age that the world takes it upon themselves to define if the church is essential or non-essential, which is a shocking thing. I understand them doing it, them being the world, Because they don't understand. But what I don't understand is that the church and its leadership allowing the world to define what the church is. When the world says, well, these are essential uh, needs and these are non-essential needs. And here in our state, they placed us, you know, in the non-essential. I had to laugh at it. Because the church is transcendent. It, It is birthed out of heaven. It is the Holy Spirit's work and presence in the church. It is an entity that is organic. Listen, it doesn't, listen, the church doesn't sell anything. The church doesn't have a business ID and a structure. We don't sell widgets. We, we don't have a, an online ordering service. This is the gospel of the living God. It's what the church is living to do. And when you and I come together, this is what's fun. Wherever you and I gather to worship God is the church. 
It could be out in the open sea in a raft. It could be at the top of a hill. It could be on the sand at the beach. It could be in the deserts of Mojave. It doesn't matter. Wherever the church gets together, that's the church. And it's absolutely awesome because wherever you and I come together, you can expect the power of God to work, assuming that it's his people coming together around the word of God opened up, that's called doctrine, and we know that the Holy Spirit takes over. We saw that it matters in three areas, that we're all in this family together, this family of God, that we are called to be witnesses, and that God has called us to take action, to be believers that put our faith uh, in practice. So church, here we go. We dive into where we left off. Number two now in verses 13 to 15, that we are called to be encouraged because of who you are, who you are. And mark it down verse 13. It's regarding God's affection, God's affection in your life and God's affection through your life to other people. Verse 13. Now I do not want you to be unaware. Some of your Bibles might use the word ignorant which is a fine word. It's not an insult. Ignorant means to be uneducated about something. You can fix ignorance. You can't fix stupid. <laughs> um, ignorance you can overcome with education. A stupid is a choice in light of education being in front of you. And Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, uninformed, or ignorant, brethren, that I often planned, listen up, church, to come to you... This is amazing. Look at the parenthetical insert here, but was hindered until now. I want to ask you right now before we press on, who do you think hindered Paul from getting to Rome? Uh, that's a great answer. I heard the Lord and I heard Satan. That's actually a very, very good division because it might appear to be Satan holding him back. It's not until we read the book of Acts that we find out that it was the Lord holding him back. Wow. Hey, it speaks about the timing of God. The timing of God is all important. That's what Paul is announcing. I desire to come to you, he's saying. But we know from the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit withstood Paul from being able to go. The natural question for us would be, why? The answer is, we don't know. Listen, has God told you to do something and be involved in something and to show God's witness by God's affection in some area? And you think, man, this is absolutely the will of God. Let's do this. And it just doesn't happen. It doesn't come together. It's a great vision. You sense God leading, but then it's hindered. And unless we seek God for discernment in the word of God, we could get really, really messed up because God has his timing. Church, be encouraged. Many times God will speak to you, but it has to go through a process of birthing or incubation. Listen, when a woman gets pregnant, that baby doesn't come out right then and there. That baby's got to grow. And that, listen... From that act of affection to the delivery of a brand new human being is God's process. And God was speaking to Paul's heart to go and to be affectionate to the church at Rome, to show them the love of God. And you would think that he would have a beeline, a direct flight that would be there in a matter of days. And yet it didn't happen that way. I want that to be an encouragement to you. God's got his timing. A lot of young people today are stressing out. Uh, I'm not married yet. I'm not married yet. God's got his time. So I'm ready. I'm ready. Well, maybe the person God has for you is not ready. Well, why doesn't God get them ready? Because God, because God doesn't put anybody in a headlock. <laughs> Powerful. He says that I might have some fruit among you also just as among the other Gentiles. So here's some examples about the affection of God working in our lives. By the way, I don't know if you're new here today or not, but you need to get ready to take notes. I'm warning you right now. That's how you're going to grow. That's how you're going to memorize. That's how you're going to remember messages in Scripture. And so write small, because we have a lot of verses today. Very important, Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to this. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 8 says... Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and to be ready for every good work. That's an act of affection coming from God. Verse 8, 
Titus 3.8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. We're talking about you and I being instruments of God and being loving instruments to not only one another, but to the world around us. The Roman Empire, by the way, made mention about how loving the Christian church was in the first and second century. Isn't that neat? What a witness. That's the greatest witness of all. We need to underscore that in our lifetime. Churches might think they're a success because they're big. That's not success. Churches might think that they're successful because they've got money. That's not success. Churches might think that they've got success because they're this or they're that or the other. No, you know what the criteria is? That church is successful if God says that church is loving. And when I say love, I mean God's love. Not this wimpy, weak, worldly love we talk about in this day and age, which is so ill. I'm talking about the love of God which you and I need to discover. And part of the discovery of knowing God's love in our own life is asking God to use you and I to love others. Look at the word fruit here, by the way. The word fruit, that I might have some fruit among you also. The word fruit here is a a word that means ongoing benefits, long-term effects for what is good. It's actually the word that we could say that the work that Paul is saying, I want to be and do among you, will have its descendants. It will have its children. Jesus said, listen, wisdom is justified by her children, which means there's an offspring to wisdom. There's an offspring to love. Ephesians chapter 2, I love this next verse. It sounds like love. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship. You guys know already. Anybody remember what that word means, workmanship? In the Greek language, poema. You ever heard that word before, poema? Of course you have, poem. For we are God's poem. What does that mean? It means that God is writing your life out before his throne and before the world, and it's a writing of love. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we, or you, should walk in them for us to walk in them. Now, I want to say this and then move on. Remember this. Works do not save you. Nobody goes to heaven by good works. The Bible's very clear. But because you are saved, one of the evidences is the fruit that comes out of your life. And that is fruitfulness or good works. The Christian church, first service, should go all around the world that you're exposed to and be known for doing good works. Not once should we be stopped and asked, oh, wow, you're going to go to heaven, aren't you, right, right, because of all your good works? Oh, no. No, because God has done a good work in me and saved my soul from hell, set my course to heaven. I'm going to go out and do good things to bless him because, listen, I want to be God's affection towards other people. And that produces fruit, all of it to the Notice of the world and to the glory of God. Okay, here comes those verses. Are you ready? That was weak. All seven of you are ready. Here we go. Here we go. John chapter 15, verse 4. Abide. Abide in me and I in you, Jesus is saying. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The word abide is the word mino. It's a fun word. It just it's and it's spelled like it sounds. Me no, M E N O. What does it mean? It means to stay, to remain, to last, to live life together. It means to dwell with one another, to draw near to God and dwell with Him. It's what Jesus said when He said, "Come to Me, come and dwell with Me." It's the dwelling of God. Let me read it again. John 15, verse 4. Me know in me. Dwell, live together in me. And I in you. You hear that? See, he just, he just gave the definition in that second statement. You in me, I in you. This is abide. This is me know. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Is this not obvious? The moment you cut the branch off, does it not wither? Of course. 
unless it mino dwells, abides, lives in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. This is the key to a fruitful Christian life. Just hang in there. Church, grab your faith, as it were, by the boots and demand that you now, of yourself, you are going to apply yourself to the obedience of God. Or how about this? I'm going to apply myself to abiding in Christ. I'm going to say what Jesus has said in the Bible. I'm going to do what Jesus said to do. And I'm going to be like Jesus said to be. And in all of that, yet that is your prayer life now. If you are a person today saying, I don't know what to pray for when I, when I go to pray. Well, that's it. Start right there. God, make me like Jesus. Amen. That ought to keep you busy for the next <laughs> hundred years. John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much, what? Fruit. Fruit for without me you can do nothing. John 15, verse 7. This is one of my favorite verses. I have to tell you personally. This is a key verse to my private prayer life. I believe this verse, and it's because this verse is true that I have boldness when I pray. I don't have eloquent prayers. I probably sound like a three-year-old when I pray to God, but you know what? I think he likes it. Here's the reason why. John 15, verse 7. If you abide, me know, in me, and my words, the Bible, abide in you, You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, why is it quiet in here? You should have cheered at that. (laughs) You want to know why we got quiet? Because it sounds like a lotto lotto verse, a lottery ticket verse. Wait, you mean I just need to scratch John 15, 7, and I win? Exactly. Like, win what? Whatever you desire. Really? Yeah, it's actually true, but there's a prerequisite to that. See, so you, were, you, were you weren't even listening to the verse until you heard the word, the part where Jesus, God will give you what you desire. Say, so what? What was that? Write it down. Honey, write that down. Write that down. We'll use that after today. It's not a rabbit's foot. It's amazing because the qualifier is if my word abides in you. If you and I are living together, Jack, says Jesus, and my word is in you, those two realities presupposes that what I'm going to desire is going to be biblical and honor God. And it's going to be right there in scripture so that when we pray, we can pray in faith, knowing that God is going to answer. He's going to answer. What you and I need to rest in is his answer. Why is it? Why is it in the last two weeks? Okay, I prayed, for, I prayed for a man. I actually didn't even pray for him to be healed. I was praying for him regarding another issue. And he was dramatically physically healed. As, and the part was when they, when they got a hold of me and said, you know what happened today? What? No, who are you? You, you prayed and this is what happened. I didn't even know, I I didn't even pray that. You didn't. God wanted to do something. But then why is it that I prayed for somebody else this week and nothing happened at all? You know what's amazing? I leave that up to God's hands, God's sovereignty. I just know this. If his word abides in me, and if I pray according to the will of God, and that will, because I live with him, right, is my desire too. You know, when you walk together... Hand in hand, or what's that game we used to play way back when they didn't have video games? You put one leg, you put one leg in a sack, and you put another leg in a sack. I mean, I mean, not, I mean, somebody else's leg in the sack. Remember that? Anybody know that game? What is it? Sack race? Anyway, you got to get the, you, you'll never work because one, one of your legs is in a sack and then you get your friend's leg in the sack and you got to get both your legs in sync in the sack for you to go forward. And if you don't get together, it ain't going to happen. You go flat on your face. Listen, when you walk with God, Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two walk together unless they're in agreement? How can two walk together unless they're in the sack? That's 
They got to get their legs in the sack. They got to go together. And when Jesus Christ walks with us, his desires become our desires. It's an awesome way to live. John 15, verses 9 through 10. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide, me know, in my love. If you keep my commands, I can't keep those commands. But I can if he is abiding in me. Then he does it. You will abide in me in my, in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide, this is amazing, me know in his love. Jesus is saying, you do what I do because this is what the Father has asked of me in these 33 years here on earth is what Jesus is saying. So you, I'm your prototype. You do what I'm doing with the Father. I'm showing you how to do this Christian walk. Put your leg in the sack. My leg is in the sack. We'll go together. And I'll show you how to do that. John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Guess what the word in the Greek language for remain is? Mino. Isn't that great? Let me read it again and change it up. John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may... Me know, abide in you, ooh, and that your joy may be full. Well, obviously, if Jesus' joy is in us, it will be full. Joy, you know, joy, that doesn't mean like, it doesn't mean you're bouncing off the walls and you're a hyper, uh, overly ca caffeinated person. <laughs> oh, look at the joy of the Lord and that person, the joy of the Lord, that's not what it means. Listen, joy, joy is having a great Deep, abiding peace of God's presence in the midst of an impossible situation. Joy is not happiness. You are not happy when a loved one dies. You're not happy when you lose your job. You're not happy when you're injured or insulted. Of course not, because happy means happenstance. Joy, on the other hand, never changes. Joy is always there. It's always constant. And all of those things, from being insulted to the death of a loved one, you've got joy. Amen. Are you weeping? Are you crying? Are you mourning? Yes. But down deep inside, when you get down to the surface, go through the surface, down through the layers, down to the foundation, there's joy. Amen. That's the Christian life. That's one of the indicators of the presence of God. That's how we can love people in difficult times, because we know this. John 15, verse 16. I love this. Uh, this is so great. I mean, I know he's saying it perfectly lovingly, but to me, sometimes it sounds uh, like, a jo like, like an awesome, anointed sarcasm when he says in, in verse 16, you did not choose me. I like that. Jesus is just saying, you did not choose me. but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should me know. Abide forever and ever and ever. The next thing we look at this is the fact that you and I, we can be encouraged and we can be an encouragement because you and I are assigned to the world. You think about that right now in the age in which we're living in, here and now in the 21st century. Christian, you are assigned to friends and family, those who know Christ, those who don't. You are a sign. You're an indicator. You're like a barometer, needle pointing to the culture that you're exposed to. In verse 14, he says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. This is absolutely amazing. Circle the word debtor. Absolutely awesome, deep, and incredible debtor. Paul the Apostle says, I am a debtor. The word debtor means to be in debt as a slave to a debt that is owed. It means to be under the obligation, in this context, under the obligation of Gratitude. It means to be a co-conspirator with another, 
working hand in hand. Listen to this. It can be translated to take back what has been lost or stolen from you or to, listen, owe others that which you have received. It's a strange word. Listen, to owe others that which you have received. Watch this. Have you ever heard? It's a real popular saying these days, pay it forward, pay it forward. You, you know, pay it forward, pay it forward. The world says that, but I want you to know that that is a Christian principle. It means this. Paul says, I am a debtor. I am a slave to Jew and Gentile, to Greek and to barbarian. In other words, you can put it this way. Paul says and believes that he's been called to be a debtor to everybody. Why, Paul? I owe the world the example of showing them God's affection and God's love and God's care and to be like a, a signal, a sign to that world for this reason. Church, don't miss it. For this reason. What God has done in my life, I could never repay him. It's so amazing that what I'm going to do is take the greatest thing in the world that could ever happen to somebody because it happened to me and I'm going to say it and speak it and preach it and tell it to every human being they come in contact with. I owe it to them. You say, well, come on, really? Maybe that's poetic. No, it's not. Listen, please listen. He understood what God had done for him and to him. And in that beautiful package, God could say to him, by the way, Paul, you actually owe me nothing. I did this for you. And Paul looked at Jesus, so to speak, and said, I got to give you something back. Well, just so as you understand, you can't give it to me. But I tell you what, if you want to tell others about what happened to you, that's cool. And Paul said, oh, then, okay, I'm indebted to every human being to tell them about what you've done to me. True Christianity is giving it away because you have it. Makes a big difference. <laughs> a sign. We are happily to give away that which has been given to us. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says, Owe no man anything except to love one another. That's our great Christian debt. We'll never pay it off in this life. What is it? Love other people. Why? Because we owe nothing. Think of it. I love this. And he says Greeks and barbarians, simply this, I don't want to belabor it. Greeks were the educated, highly refined people of the day. Barbarians were anything that the Greeks viewed as uneducated, non-Greek barbarian. And by the way, Rome considered themselves the Greeks. They weren't Greek, but they considered themselves Greek in this sense. Highly cultured, highly educated. In fact, the Romans got their government, think about it, from the Grecian Empire. They just perfected it. If you called somebody back in those days a Greek, you're giving them a great compliment. If you're saying of them that they're barbarians, you are saying that they're not refined, not educated. If you're saying to them that you are wise, you are notable, that's to be saying something. If you say to the unwise, you're saying to people who are extremely common. Did not Jesus Christ preach the gospel to the emperor, so to speak, right? Pilate, Caesar, Herod. Of course. Did he not find himself as friends among the prostitutes and debased commoners of the day and children? Yes. Remarkable truth. Awesome power. It's to have an IOU to the human race. And I got to tell you, personally, I look around and I see what the human race does to one another and it makes me sick as it makes you sick. And listen, we have to fight. I'm fighting this right now. I see the evils of the world and it makes me want to just cut myself off from it. And then I, and then I hear God's conviction say, Jack, I love them. Say, so I don't, Jesus. I don't love them. <laughs> and then he reminds me, do you know where they're going if they die without me? Oh, now you got me. 
Listen, God, now you got me because I don't like them, but I'm going to heaven and I'm totally happy and fine with that because of what you've done. Without you, I would be over there with them. Oh, so I get it. You want me to be assigned to them. That's right, Jack. What do people say when they see you? This is our great burden as a believer. What is our witness? What is our sign? When somebody sees us, do they say, you know what, I can't stand that person, that person makes me sick. I get that a lot, by the way. You guys think, what, do you guys think it's all roses with me? Look, I'm among friends right now. As soon as I leave this building, it's not easy out there. I see a lot of fingers and they're not one-way signs. <laughs> Here's the thing. When people see you, they see a sign yes. indicating a direction. Yes. If people are upset with you because they don't like the, the, the direction your sign of your life is, if your sign is pointing to heaven, if your boss or your employers see you and they know that you're a believer and you're pointing as, with the lifestyle to heaven, they don't like it. They don't want to go there because they, want, they don't want anything to do with heaven. So they hate you for that. But if they don't know what's, what direction you're pointing, then uh, it's, uh, they don't care. But the moment your sign is pointing the direction, now something's up. And we are to be a sign to the Greek, to the barbarian. What does that mean today? I don't know. I'm guessing to the, to the self-proclaimed intelligentsia of our day, Right? The PhDs and the college grads and the whatever they say they are. We'll cover more of that in Romans chapter 1 coming up. <laughs> to those who can barely read or write or just scratch out a living, it matters. It matters. I'm going to give you a string of verses again. We'll go as fast as we can. Are you guys ready? Are you guys okay? Yes. Okay, listen, get ready. This is a big one. Here you go. Why am I going to bring this up? Watch this. This is very, very important. We have, we, we now, we now uh, have declared because of God, because God has saved us, because we're Christians, because we have been so encouraged by him, we have an IOU to the world. We have an IOU to the world. You say, why and how? Why, why, why and how? Number one, Genesis chapter one, verses one to three. Now the Lord said to Abram, watch everybody. Remember, Paul just said to the Greek and to the barbarian, right? To the wise and to the unwise. Um, he's also, obviously, Paul being a Jew, he's speaking to the Jews. Watch this. This gets fun. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Abram was the first Jew. Would you agree with that? He was the first Jew? He said, wait a minute. If he was the first Jew. He was the first Jew. He said, I'm Jewish and I know Abraham. He's Jewish. True. But before Abraham was Jewish, he was a Gentile. Right? This is encouraging. Because we read in the Bible that we are to be loving and ministering and sharing and preaching the gospel to Jew and Gentile, to wise and unwise, Greek and barbarian, right? Why would we do that? Because there's a, there's a thinking in some people, well, we're God's people, we don't talk to you Gentiles. Wait a minute. The guy that you claim to be your father was first a Gentile, Abraham. Give us a break. So watch this. God said to him, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. My argument begins right here regarding God's salvation 
through to others and working it through those who know him is the fact that do you think God is somehow parsed up and divided regarding these go to heaven and these go to hell? And it goes like this. These are Jews and these are Gentiles. Listen, absolutely not. God says, first of all, I'm going to create a land that I'm going to call my land, and I'm going to create a people that I'm going to call my people, and I'm going to do it with a guy by the name of Abram, who will be later renamed Abraham. He goes from being a Gentile in Ur of the Chaldees, a pagan worshiping man, to becoming the first Jew monotheist worshiping the one God of heaven and earth. So we start there, that God first saves... (laughs) a Gentile, and makes him a Jew. And I love that because the word Jew means to praise the Lord. Is your name Judy? If your name's Jude, it means praise the Lord. I like that. It is awesome. Psalm 22, 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before me. Listen, my dear friend, if you're Jewish, thank you. The very Old Testament scriptures that you've preserved for us, it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that says, I'm going to save the nations of the world. Enter, fill in the blank. That's me. That's you. The remarkable declaration found in Isaiah 49, 5 and 6, listen to this. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb, this is a messianic statement, this is the Messiah speaking. Now listen, this was written 743 years before Jesus was born. It's going to describe the the mission of the Messiah. And there's a holy dialogue going on here right now. And the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that's Israel, so that Israel is gathered to him. For, he says, I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. This is the Messiah speaking. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the uh, preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. Say amen. Amen. You're going to heaven right now because, I've, because of Isaiah 49, verse 6. We could go home right now. Church is done. Seriously, it's done. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says in the Old Testament, I'm going to save Gentiles. That's awesome. That you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 56, 6. Also, the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable or accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all, the word nations is Gentiles. Isaiah 60, verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. You guys okay with this? You don't sound encouraged to me. I want you to be encouraged. Listen, God is going to save the nations who turn to him the peoples who turn to him. The question is, have you turned to him? This is awesome. Jeremiah 16, verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come to you. Zechariah 2, 11. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, says God. Wow, what is awesome. Malachi, I know it looks like an Italian uh, prophet, but it's Hebrew. It's, you want to say Malachi? <laughs> but it's Malachi, it's Hebrew. Malachi 1, verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, the name of the Lord shall be great among the Gentiles. 
2 Timothy 1.11, 2 Timothy 1.11, to which I was appointed, says Paul, a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. God wouldn't send Paul or anybody else to preach the gospel of the Gentiles unless he wanted them to be saved. Amen. I'm not going to quote this verse. It just came into my memory. It should have come into my memory when I was studying. I forgot it. It's a good one. The book of Romans teaches us, Paul teaches us, that we as believers who are Gentiles, our love for God is to provoke the Jew to jealousy. Have you ever had that happen? That's awesome. It's awesome when a Jew sees how much you know about his Old Testament Bible, that it gets him all messed up and, and upset. Oh, I see. Oh, I can't even stop. I got to keep going. The things I see in my head and the moments where this has happened. Oh. I've argued with so many Jews. I love it. That what's weird about it? You know, have you ever spent like too much time maybe down south? I don't mean San Diego. I mean down like Louisiana, Alabama. Uh, how about just going to Texas for the weekend? You come back and you say, let's turn on our Bibles, y'all. You know that thing? I preached one time. Listen, I, I wish they would invite me back. I guess I didn't do a good job. But I, I spoke at an all-black church in Arlington, Virginia. I was the only, Lisa and I were the only white people in the church. It was so awesome. Because I'm talking, I'm just totally, totally white. I'm just talking Jesus and Jesus. And they're going, come on now. And I'm like. And they're, and they're. I'm, I'm going, I remember it was in Matthew's gospel, it was about the, uh, the deity of Christ, and somebody then says, bring it, bring it now, and I'm like, yeah, and I found out, man, by the end of that service, I was talking, come on ass, I'm on that, just Jesus, and, his, and number one, I found out that I was actually black on the inside, which is awesome. <laughs> But what happened, what happened was this, this oneness that I'm, I'm joking, I'm not, I mean, I'm telling you exactly how it was, but I'm repeating it. It was no doubt funny, but the amazing thing was there was this association and love one for another that just could not be denied. And, and what, I, what I love about that what I love about that is the fact that that's a picture of heaven to me. Look, if you think that there should be a black section in heaven and a white section and a yellow section and a red section over there and this kind of section over there, listen, you're not going to, you won't be there. You're not, you're because, listen, because your heart's messed up. That's sick. <laughs> that, that's sick. It's just weird. When you look at heaven, it's altogether different. Why? Because God will save people out of the nations. Absolutely yeah. thrilling. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. But the Lord stood with me, says Paul, and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Ephesians 3, 8. To me, who am less than the least of the saints, this grace has, uh, was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Acts 15, 14. Simon, or Peter, has declared how God at the first visit of the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Acts 15, verse 3. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. Isn't that awesome? We're almost done. Galatians 3, verse 8. And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Acts 17, 17. Therefore he reasoned, this is Paul, in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers. That's a miracle. 
and the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. I owe you. God saves you. Dear, dear church, if you're saved, you already know. You already knew this message before I got out here. You owe the world the message. If it's inside of you, it has set you on fire. And you've got to tell somebody. Remarkable. Thirdly is this. You and I, we are a light to the lost. Romans 1.15 says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He said, well, Jack, wait a minute. I thought there was a bunch of Christians he's writing to. He is. He is. But listen to this. It's very smart what Paul is announcing. Very smart. The correct way to look at this verse is in uh, twofold. Two answers to this verse. One is every time we hear the gospel preached, it equips us more and more to preach the gospel. You and I need to be reminded. You know, there's, I forget his name. It doesn't matter. A great preacher, preacher of yesteryear said that every day he would preach the gospel to himself. Notice, I'm not saying, and he didn't say you need to get saved every day. He only gets saved once. But to set his rudder, his compass for the day, he would preach the gospel to himself. That's good. (laughs) The second thing is this. Every time we hear the gospel preached, it should challenge us personally to embrace it again. So when we first get up in the morning, we preach the gospel to ourselves because we're reminded it's in us. It's cooking. It's like a crock pot. It's there, and it's not not cooling down. And the second thing is that being true then it's got to it's gotta be shared. It's got to be, the hey, take out of the crock pot what's in it and serve it. A lot of fun. A lot of, lot, lot of great joy in that. Number three, church, we'll go as far as we can on the third one. And I, I want, I'm asking God, please stop the clock. Break it if you must. <laughs> Cause the sun to go back a little bit. But we're called to be encouraged, church. And that's because of what you are of what you are. Number one, you are now, you are compelled of God. God has gotten a hold of your life and he is the one that now takes you, uses you, and applies you to life, to the world around you. You you are being compelled by God. You come to Bible study, you get the word of God in you, and listen, if God is at work in your life when you leave the building, it's like, what are we gonna do? Let's, let's, God has done such great things, let's go for it. Okay, listen, you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's right now, and there's this little guy, there's, he's, he's lime green, he's got an orange hat on, he's a little guy, he's got one eyeball over here, he's a little silhouette of a guy, he's made out of plastic, he's all weather, he's got a little handle on his back, you can grab him, he's got a little flag too, he's got a little flag, he sticks in his hand, he's got one little hand, and he, and he look, he's there, listen, you can put him out, you can set these guys up like terracotta warriors, they're everywhere, you can set him up, and there he is right there, he's got a little sign. All weather, okay, it can be 100 degrees outside or it can be 30 degrees outside. He's just right there. (laughs) Never complains, never gripes, never says a word, right? Uh, But listen, he's got a handle on him and you grab him and you just put him wherever you need him. That's the believer. God says, you know what? I need this done over there. Mm, Okay, I'm gonna boom, grab you. And you're just like, yay! (laughs) Woo, you're like, yeah! Listen, that would be that you're compelled. That means that he's doing it. He's got you. What does that look like? The scripture says right here, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul is saying, can you imagine he's standing there? He's gone through the stuff that he's gone through. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Listen, he would say that. He'd go to SoFi Stadium right now and say that today. He'd go to, he'd go to the Rose Bowl, 100,000 seats. Paul would go right to the 50... Yard line. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He would do it. He said, man, those people, those people really, they, they, look, there's obnoxious people who ought not to be doing stuff like that. And then there's people who are called to do that, who are compelled by God. And you know the difference. One is a total turnoff, even to Christians. It's like, oh boy. 
God, please, put those guys away. And then God speaks through someone, and, it's, and people listen. People are wanting to hear more. It's quite amazing. Why? Because you're being compelled by God. When he says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, listen to this. It's one of the most powerful, beautiful declarations, and it should encourage us. The word actually means I'm proud of the gospel, but it's not, like, it's not the pride that you and I disdain. Paul is saying the gospel is everything. I owe the world the preaching of the gospel, says Paul. And I'm not ashamed of it. The word ashamed means to turn away from it. It means to step away, to shriek back. The word means to deny association with. It means to, in acting, in re recoiling back, it means to deny or to reject. Do you remember when Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before people, I will acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. If you deny me before people, I will deny you. I said this verse a couple of months ago, and I shared a, a situation where a young man that was attending this church that day would not, he did not, ex, he did not uh, ex, acknowledge. The opportunity was given, people were going, coming forward, but he didn't do it. And then later, he, want, he came to me and he said, I, I want to do it with nobody looking. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And people wrote me letters of how mean I was. Yeah, how could you dare do that? You, you might have condemned this person to hell. First of all, if I have that kind of power, uh, that's scary. <laughs> that's not how it works. Thank God, you're not going to go to heaven or hell based upon someone else's faithfulness. But the guy wanted the benefits of Jesus, but he didn't want to have any embarrassment of really being seen with Jesus. Oh, I love you, honey, so much. I love you so much. I'll see you soon. And then when you see them soon, you treat them like a stranger? No. No, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What an awesome statement. Very quickly, here's why. He believed it. Acts 9, verse 6, in his conversion. So Paul, trembling and astonished, said... Lord, what do you want me to do? In his moment of his conversion, I believe you, Jesus. What do you want me to do? Secondly, he confessed openly the gospel. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the gospel. Amen. Thirdly, he suffered for it. He suffered for the gospel. Look, I never want to put anything in front of the rapture of the church. It would be theologically wrong for me. The, the Lord could come back today. There's no prerequisites of Bible prophecy that preempt the rapture. None. The rapture could happen any second. Having said that, if it doesn't happen any second, it's possible that in the next few minutes, hours, days, or months, persecution could be launched against you, against us, against me. Suffering solidifies a lot of things. Suffering makes things real clear. When you're suffering, you check to see what's really beneath your feet. It's not money. It's not people. It's not anything this world can give. I'm not saying those things are bad. But if you trust in them, they're bad. But is he there in your suffering? 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, he says, are they ministers? He's talking about others who proclaim, true or false. Are, others, uh, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, that's beatings, above measure. In other words, I've been beaten so much, nobody can count how many times I've been beaten. Can you imagine what Paul's body looked like? Because wow. this happened to him over years. Man, does that shock you? I thought, I thought God's ministers had, had diamond rings on their pinky fingers with motorcades and, <laughs> and uh, crowns on their head and lives, they live in palaces. Paul wouldn't have known anything about that. 
You know that? In prisons more frequently. What if this was a, what if you're interviewing to hire pastors? Hey, take off your shirt. What? Well, we're going to see if we're going to hire you. We just want to make sure we're hiring the right person. Take your shirt off. We want to see how many beatings and scars you have on your back. Oh, and one other thing. Can we, can we see how many times you've been arrested? <laughs> can you imagine? Yes, we're hiring pastors this week at Calvary. <laughs> if you'd like to apply, bring your rap sheet. <laughs> Let's see how many times you've been arrested for being a Christian. <laughs> oh, my gosh. In deaths, often... Left for dead. Yikes. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. 39. Five, five times 39, I got beat up. Three times I was beaten with, with rods. Once I was stoned. Not, listen, this is not drugs. This is not California. This is with rocks. Can you imagine taking stones to the head? Three times I was shipwrecked. Not once, three times. Three times the ship went down. A night and a day I've been in the deep. Can you imagine swimming for a night and a day? Waiting, waiting. Can you imagine what's on his mind? Am I, this, is this how I die? Is this the end? Think about it. God, if you're, if you're here to rescue me, send a, a log by or a turtle or something. Right? <laughs> Paul, what? <laughs> Remarkable. Verse 26, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, I hunger, or in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. <laughs> this is Paul's life. This is Paul's life. He's compelled. You see, Jack, wait, he's going to tell people to become a Christian after all that? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because what, listen, what you're compelled to do is worth it. It's worth it. <gasps> secondly, listen, secondly, we're ambassadors. Oh boy, do I have to hurry. Ambassadors, verse 15, verse 16, ambassadors of God. Church, you and I are ambassadors of God. And so it says in verse 16, for this is, for it is, that is the gospel, the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I'm going to do this very, very quickly, church. Listen up very, very carefully. We are called to be ambassadors. That means that what you and I, this is remarkable, because it doesn't mean that you and I have been born into an earthly setting, and that is our ambassadorship. That, that because you might have been born into the church, because your mom, your mom played the organ at the Baptist church, and your dad was a, a Lutheran minister, that automatically you're going to go to heaven. No, 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 not at all. You've got to become an ambassador, and God selects his ambassadors. Any king is the one who chooses his own representative representation to other countries. The word used here as an ambassador in our lives is the word throughout the Bible that speaks of us being Christians who are ambassadors being sent to a hostile nation. As representatives of Jesus, God wants us to be an ambassador to the Jew first. Why? Because the gospel came to the Jew first and to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And this is precious, and then I'll move on to the end. It's this. To be an ambassador for Christ, you have to be born again into the family of God. Amen. You can't assume it. And for you to be born again into the family of God, you have to be adopted by God into the family. Think of that. Older kids of siblings often would torture the younger one by saying, you know, mom and dad... We don't know what happened. They came home with you one day. <laughs> didn't, you, didn't your brother tell you that? Yes. Yeah, of course. We, you're all nodding. Yes. yes. Your brother or your bigger sister always said, you know what? We were born here. You were adopted. Yes. You need to know that. Yes. 
So wait a minute, biblically speaking, the Christian comes right back and says, yeah, I'm really sorry for you. So what do you mean? Well, yeah, you're right. I was adopted into this family. That means they absolutely picked me out. They walked the hallway. They were praying. They're, th they're looking. Not that one. Not that one. Nah, maybe that one. Not that one. No way. That, hmm. This, you know what? We're going to take that guy. We're gonna, we want him right there. This one right here. Wait, which one? The one. Big nose, big ears. This one. This one. And they picked. And you became an ambassador of that family. God looks down from heaven and says, this one right here. So listen. That's why you must be born again. Because you have to be adopted. You cannot be adopted in the family of God unless you're born again. When you're born again because you've been adopted by God, then you become an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And you'll tell anyone the gospel who's standing up and breathing. Jew, Gentile, barbarian, Greek, wise or unwise. And then we end here. It's boldness. We're the boldness of God to this world. How else do you think, church? Listen, you guys can stand, really. Because I'm in so much trouble right now. It's so late. <laughs> Let's stand. You guys, listen. Boldness. You and I are to be the boldness of God to this world. How do you think God's going to show his boldness to the world? And when I mean boldness, I mean good. When it says, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That is written, the just shall live by faith. When we start up in our next teaching here in Romans, allow me to hover a little bit on verse 17 before we go in to verses 18 and on. God says the just shall live by faith. It has, friends, listen, it's always been the case from Abraham to the end of time. Those who are declared righteous by God are declared righteous by God by their faith in him. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.